For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. Thank you for joining us for part one of Between Two Truths Again. Now this message is a part of a greater series entitled The Whole Truth. That was the first message we shared and it was entitled Between Two Truths. And you can access that message by going to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. In that message, we took a look at the fact that the Bible presents truths that appear to be contradictory or moving in the opposite directions to each other, but in fact are part of a comp complete gospel picture that Jesus wants to present to you and to me. Jesus said that in John chapter 10, verse 35, the scriptures cannot be broken. Paul said, writing to Timothy, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So there's no way that one thing one Bible writer says and another thing another Bible writer says are ever contradictory to each other. The Old Testament doesn't contradict the New and the New doesn't contradict the Old. This is a part of a complete package that God brings to each one of us. Some of the truths that we looked at in our first message and we talked about was the fact that the Bible presents God's law, but it also presents God's grace. The Bible talks about faith and it also talks about works. It talks about the sovereignty of God and it also talks about the free will of man. These ideas are not opposed to each other, but again, complete one harmonious picture, kind of like a, an ellipse, uh, the shape of a football, and you have two focal points as opposed to a circle, which just has one. An ellipse has two focal points, and without those two focal points, you destroy the ellipse. And oftentimes, God presents truth that way. Truth, the truth of justification and sanctification, the truth of love and obedience, the truth of faith and works. So in today's presentation, we're going to go further we're going to take a look at three biblical tensions that exist in the Christian's life. There's a lot more to come. It's exciting. Open your Bibles. Join us as we go live now to Between Two Truths again. You know as well as I do that life can sometimes be a balancing act between two competing ideals. Uh, one simple, often one simple act, such as casting a vote, can involve us in a dilemma. Should we vote for the candidate who takes the right moral stand but clearly isn't capable for the position, or the candidate who is far more competent yet has some ideas you can't agree with? Sometimes the decisions can be even more personal. I read where a certain family had been approached by their precinct captain virtually begging for their vote. It looked like the party-backed candidate was going to lose, and if he lost, that meant the captain precinct would lose his job unless he could show that he delivered the vote in his precinct and could transfer or could transfer that loyalty to the other candidate. Should the family then vote for the candidate they prefer or help a man save his job? If they voted as they hoped, they might even get the trees they requested a year earlier. By the way, the notice that the trees would be planted arrived on election day. Dilemmas aren't limited to only these issues. Hard choices permeate our lives. You only have to open the newspaper or turn on the TV and hear competing ideas vying for our loyalty. Many of our laws and court cases are attempts to find balance between, for example, security and liberty. Both are human basic needs, but they exist in tension with each other. For instance, the freedom of the press and the interests of national security clash continually. Curfews and search warrants, drug testing and surveillance are all practices that promote security, but sometimes at the expense of liberty. Yet unbridled liberty would make us victims of others, thus destroying our security. The solution to these things is keeping these things in healthy tension to each other. And we'll talk about what that means in a moment. A similar tension, tension permeates our faith. Every biblical truth we know is basically balanced by another truth that seems to be moving in the opposite direction. For example, the gift of God's grace 
does not come without requirements. You have grace and you have responsibility. You also have freedom. Freedom is not given without responsibility. And in Christ, in Jesus, we deal with more than one reality at a time. Our faith is often lived out between two truths, neither of which can or should be given up. Now, Christians have often wrestled with this fact that our faith gives us two or more realities that must be held in tension to each other, that the issue has dominated theological thinking throughout church history. We affirm both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. We also affirm the sovereignty of God and the free will of man, that humans are sinners and yet made in the image of God. Throughout Christian history, heresy has resulted not necessarily from someone wanting to be evil or wanting to be heretical, but from someone taking a piece of the truth to an extreme and not doing justice to the other truths as well. In reality, uh, the devil is the mastermind behind part truths, but uh, he even gets more bold by promoting part truth lies. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, just for a way of review. We talked about this when I discussed living between two truths before, but go over, over with me to Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. You recall in the Garden of Eden that Satan beguiled Eve, and he did that by preaching three part truth lies. What were they? Look at Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. He said, the serpent said to the woman, you shall not, what? Surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So what were those three part truth lies? You shall not surely die. You shall be like God and you shall know good and and evil. The devil was preaching the part truth of God's grace apart from his justice. God's not going to do what He really says. He's too gracious. He's too loving. And so He separated the truth of God's grace from the truth of God's justice, you see. And then after Eve succumbed and Adam as well, the devil just kind of left them in their sin and condemned them with the part truth of God's absolute justice apart from His grace. You know, sometimes the devil does that to each one of us, doesn't he? Oh, it's okay, just a little bit of that. It's okay, God will understand. It's okay, just this once. And when you just go ahead and succumb, what does the devil do? You know, God's not going to take you back. You've done it again. You've you've failed. God's not going to express and and issue grace to you. The devil is master in promoting part truth, part truths and part truth lies. The enemy of souls always seeks to pit one truth against another as if, They were in conflict with each other. He revels in dividing what God has put together. One author wrote, he said that there are a great number, a great number of truths which seem contradictory and which all hold together in a wonderful system. I shared with you a couple of examples that I got from a couple of books that I read. Take a sphere, for example, a sphere. To split the diameter of a sphere makes two opposite halves out of a whole. The same thing happens when with the sphere of truth is divided. It creates two opposite yet part truth hemispheres. Yet both truths are required to make a whole. So if one speaks a half truth, they convey a vital part truth, but each part truth is isolated from the complement of truth. It's complement of truth. The Bible often brings two principles together. For example, the sovereignty of God, the free will of man, revealing that they are not in opposition to each other, but they are in harmony, forming a complete whole. Not half truth, but the whole truth. There was another example I shared with you, the ellipse. The ellipse of truth. The ellipse is a stretched out circle, kind of like a football. Uh, one, a circle has one center of focus, but an ellipse actually has two points of focus. Uh, not pushed too far from each other. And this, the perfect, if they are pushed far enough from each other, the perfect ellipse breaks and it no longer exists. Also, if one emphasizes one focus over the other, the ellipse simply becomes two circles. It's as simple as that. So, I shared with you how we get water from this ellipse. Water doesn't exist. 
uh, with, unless the circle of hydrogen and the circle of oxygen are brought into the ellipse. If someone asked what would be more important, the answer would be equally important, especially if you were thirsty, especially if you wanted a drink of water. Much like asking whether we could live without the heart or without the brain. We can't live without both. Both are equally important to life. And truth is the same way. Truth must be looked at in the form of an ellipse to oppose or to ignore, underemphasize one truth against the other would make two circles and you destroy the ellipse. Now, I want to talk to you about biblical tensions, keeping two truths, twin truths, in healthy tension to each other, because this is where we're going to launch off uh, from here this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Demetrius, are you there, Demetrius? Demetrius plays the guitar, and he plays the guitar very well. We could use the same uh, illustration with the harp here, but we're going to have Demetrius share with us here. The strings on a guitar are anchored at two points, are they not? And I don't even know what these things are called. They're anchored here, and they're anchored up, up here in this area. Now, uh, if one of those strings were not tightened adequately, if there was no tension on that string, Demetrius, would you mind playing a chord for us? Yay. Let's play that again. Can you hear that? Does that sound harmonious and nice? Okay, what happens when you add tension to the actual chord? Oh, we're getting a mic here. Thank you, Michael. All right. What chord is that? A it's an A minor. So when the chord is not tightened between those two anchor points, you can't make beautiful music. But when the chords are anchored and firmly tense between those two anchor points, then Demetrius can play beautiful music, you see. Wonderful. Thank you, Demetrius. Excellent. Appreciate that. And twin truths act the same way. Twin truths must be held in tension to each other. That's the only way for them to be completely true. Both ideas must be held together in tension and thus in balance, in harmony. When you think about truths being held together in tension, think of these stringed instruments. Uh, properly attached at the two places, the instrument can be played and it creates beautiful music. If, string, if a string is left loose, you can't play. If the string is stretched too tightly, what happens? pop. I wasn't going to have Demetrius ex give us an example on that one, but the string will what? Pop. It will break, and you can't play music at all, you see. So when we talk about biblical tensions, twin truths being in tension to each other, think about simply a musical instrument, a, a guitar, or a stringed instrument like the, the harp you see, where the strings are attached and anchored in two places, and yet must be tense in order for them to play beautiful music. The point is simply that God wants us to embrace twin truths, not to pit one against the other, so that not only is our theology right, but that our lives would be right, and that God can play beautiful music through and in our lives. Don't you want Him to play beautiful music in your life? Truly, truly. So let's talk about the reality of tension, biblical tension in the Bible. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, the unhappy preacher in, in chapter 7, verses 14 to 18, saw the complexity of life and he warned against going to extremes. And then in Ecclesiastes, I'm just going to give you several verses and you can write them down. In Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, he points out that everything in life has its time. The things that he lists are generally seen as opposites. For instance, a time to weep and a time to laugh, right? Uh, God, God is concerned. The Bible's reveal a God that is concerned in revealing himself to human beings, but at the same time, he hides himself. Humans can't see him and yet and continue to live. With one hand, God prevents people from approaching him because he's too holy, yet on the other hand, he draws them to himself because of his love. We're just we're just covering some basics here. Uh, we, we, we see these things, we've talked about these things before, but we just want to cover some basics. The New Testament also provides examples. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through what? Faith, it's a gift of God, right? It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And yet you go to James chapter 2, verse 24, and James says, you see then, that a man is justified by his works and not faith alone. Now, we're not going to address those points, but you see two truths here. 
and they must be held in healthy tension to each other. They're not opposed to each other. They're not opposed to each other. They're one complete truth. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus said, Judge not that ye be, ne- be ye not judged. You go over to verse 16, and he says, By their fruits you shall know them. Right, in the words of John, uh, John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, they also appear to be contradictory. Jesus says, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. <laughs> now, Paul, he seemed to be a pretty, mas- pretty much a master about writing, uh, writing about biblical tensions. Look, look with me at Galatians. We're going to our scripture reading. Galatians chapter 2, and we'll read verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and uh, verse 20. Paul said, he said, I am crucified, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20 contains, these intri- contains those very intriguing words. Not only does Paul present twin truths in this passage that are rich theologically and must be held in healthy tension to each other, we have been crucified with Christ, yet Christ lives in me. These twin truths. But these twin truths also speak to an experience each of God's children are to have. Again, so that God can play beautiful music in and on our lives. This means that the twin truths must be held together in tension and thus in harmony in our lives. Now, in some ways, in some ways, tension is actually increased by belonging to Jesus Christ. It may seem strange to hear that biblical faith increases tension, but there is no question that it does. Now, keep in mind that this tension is not harmful. This tension is not destructive. Remember, think about the harp. Think about the the guitar, stringed instrument, you see. These things are not harmful or destructive. Rather, as somebody put it, they are peaceful and creative. More on that in a moment. There are three twin truths, three twin truths that are always at work in the believer's life, in yours and my life, and they're foundational to others that we'll discuss in the upcoming couple of weeks. Here they are, number one, and uh, we're going to go through these quickly, and then we'll have them up on the screen one at a time. They are gift and response, They are living in this world in anticipation of the next and then experiencing the death and resurrection of Jesus in our lives. So number one, and it's up there on the screen, gift and responsibility. New life in Jesus is both, and I think you would agree with me, both a gift and also a what? A responsibility. There's no doubt about that. The gospel both grants life and also demands life. Jesus granted life limitless grace to His hearers when He invited the tax collectors and He invited the sinners to receive His free gift of salvation. But Jesus also demanded limitless obedience from those who accepted His free offer of salvation. Are you with me this morning? Okay, so we see this dynamic at work in many passages in the Bible where the writer goes from the fact of the gospel, what God has given to the believer, to the command of the gospel, the responsibility of you and I, the child of God. Go with me to Colossians. You're just a few pages pages over from Galatians. Go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. Notice here, here we have verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3, we have a command, you see, from God. This is the responsibility or the response from God's children when they receive His grace. Colossians 3, verse 3, Paul says, for you died and your life is hidden with you in Christ. So Paul states that we have died with Jesus when we gave our hearts, our lives to Him, when we accepted Him by faith. And then He commands us to put to death what belongs in our earthly natures. Look at verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. So he says that you have died in Christ, but you need to put to death your Uh, your members, you see. Put to death those things that belong to your earthy, earthly nature. So, this blend between fact and command, between gift and responsibility is common, and it's particularly common in some of the epistles. Go over to Peter, 
1 Peter. We're going to just go around the Scriptures here and take a look at this in its totality uh, here this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Notice what Peter says. Peter says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren... What's that? Is that, a, is that a command or a fact? That's a, that's a fact, right? Now that you've done these things, notice what he goes on to say here. Love one another fervently with a pure heart. Is that, a, is that gift or responsibility? Is that fact or command? It's a command, that's right. And then he says, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again. That is the supporting fact. So here you see in Peter's writings, you have the fact and you have the command. You have the gift and you have the responsibility, the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to unfeign love of the brethren, and then the command to therefore love your, your uh, brethren, you see. Let's go over to Romans now, Romans chapter 6. Let's take a look at this again, Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. <clears throat> Here Paul gives a command. Notice what his command is. He says, Therefore, do not sin, do not let rather sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. What is that? A fact or a command? A gift or a responsibility? It's a responsibility. It's a command, is it not? Surely. Now look at look at, over with me to verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. All right, is that a gift? Or is that a responsibility? Or is that a fact or a command? It is a fact. It is a gift. God promises that sin will not reign and rule in your lives. That's His gift of grace, you see. And yet there is the command to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. More could be shared. The Christian life is lived out between gift and responsibility in the pursuit, listen carefully, of becoming what we, God already considers us in Christ. That's, that's what we're talking about. The Christian life is lived out between, the gift, between gift and responsibility in the pursuit of becoming what we already are in Jesus Christ. The twin truth of gift and responsibility are vitally important as they prevent spiritual disaster from taking place in our lives. The dynamic between Christ's gifts and our responsibility is the reason Christian tension is peaceful. The fact of the gospel allows us to trust in God's grace and the power of His promises, and therefore it leads us to deal creatively with the commands that He gives us, you see. This tension also prevents us from accepting a do-nothing religion. We shouldn't be misled into thinking that God's commands, such as consider yourself to be dead, you read that in Romans 6 verse 11, Paul says consider yourself to be dead. Uh, we shouldn't be mis misled into thinking that that command is a pious example of wishful thinking or an attempt at self-delusion. Instead, this, this verse is a call to make the gospel real in each one of our lives. These, these truths invite us to take seriously what God has done in Christ and to view ourselves as God views us. Just another example of this before we move on to the next one. Jesus' parable of the unforgiving servant. And that's found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 21 to 35. That parable provides a sobering perspective on the nature of tension between gift and responsibility. Although the servant had been forgiven an enormous debt, he demanded his servant to pay a much smaller amount. You remember the story, right? He was forgiven a great debt, but he came to his servant who had a small debt and was, uh, was rude and demanded that he pay that. His master then judged him severely and said, should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? So we can't, in, in, in other words, we cannot claim the gift of God's forgiveness if we are not willing to own the responsibility of forgiving others. Gift and responsibility. That's one area of, of, of Christian tension that must be, tension that must be held in healthy tension in our lives. 
these, this, the twin truths of gift and responsibility. Life in Jesus Christ isn't always easy, for we are called to grow continually by following the way of the cross. Someone said, and this is my prayer for each one of us as I close, may God keep us from the fanaticism of the extremes and the mediocrity of the middle road. May our life be a life in faith in Jesus Christ. May we let him work in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. May we know that we are his children. We've got to know that here today, friends. We've got to know that we are Christ's children. Have we come to him with true hearts, sincere hearts, repentant hearts? Have we opened our lives and our minds to him to say, Christ, I need you and I need you as savior of my life. If we've done that, then we can know that we are a child of God, forgiven. But do you also know that he's expecting you to now to act like a child of God? Do you know your need of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that comes into your life and works that change? God declares that we are his children, but that the power of his word makes us his children. Do you know that today? We must know these things today. To live a life in Christ is not boring. To live a life in Christ is exciting, challenging, yes, but it is the real life. And may that life in Christ we receive and we accept wholeheartedly today. We're glad you've joined us for part one of the presentation Between Two Truths again. Now, this is a, a message that's a part of a greater series entitled The Whole Truth. And so if you want to hear the first message, go to uh, saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. In today's presentation, we learned that the Bible teaches truths that appear to be contradictory, opposed to each other, but are really not. In fact, they are complementary or twin truths. And when held together in perfect tension, like the strings on a guitar or a violin or even a harp, create a perfect picture of God's whole truth, His will for you and for me. Now, there are three biblical tensions that are at play in the Christian's life that we all have to deal with. And in this presentation, we looked at the first one, and that is salvation is both gift and responsibility. Gift because Jesus offers it to us as a, as, as a free gift and uh, responsibility because that is our response to the gospel. There are still two others we need to take a look at, and uh, we're going to get to that in the second part of this series, living as Christians in this world in preparation for the next, and experiencing both the death and resurrection of Jesus in our lives. So there's still more to come. Stay tuned, and we look forward to seeing you for part two of Between Two Truths again. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.